Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our second main speaker, who is the Dean of the Modern Austrian School. Very often it is being said that newer generations are standing on the shoulders of giants. Yet, in the case of Professor Hulsman, it would have been a clear understatement, for he ranks amongst very few who are actually carrying the tradition on his own shoulders by making sure that Austrian economics is advancing and attempting to answer present theoretical challenges. He wrote crucial and thought-provoking papers on the theory of free banking, monetary policy, interest, time preference theory, welfare economics, entrepreneurship, counterfactuals, equilibrium theory, capital theory. I could really go on, and as many of you know, I'm not exaggerating. Amongst his scholarly achievements, two, book, two books deserve mentioning. Uh, we have them in Polish, that's uh, Ethics, of Money, Ethics of Money Production, published a couple of years ago. And now, uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, Last Night of Liberalism, that is fully published in two volumes. The latter book is uh, often presented as a biography, which can be confusing, since it does not only contain intellectual biography of Mises, but is one of the best works ever written on critical topics in the history of economic thought in general. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Guido Hulsman. Yeah, thank you very much. After, after such a welcome, it can only go down, down the hill, right? I already reached the top in your uh, estimation, and now you will be confronted with the reality. Okay, my uh, topic today is uh, positive externalities, free society versus interventionism. Uh, Professor Mackay told me that the, the conference, the general theme of the conference would be government interventionism. So I thought about some topic that was in line with my, my own current research. Uh, which deals with the economics of gratuitous goods, so non-paid-for goods, uh, like gifts, but also spontaneous uh, gratuitous goods, about which I will say a few words later, and government interventionism. But before we even get to this, so this is the overview of what will come in the next few minutes, uh, we'll talk about uh, a few famous economists from Wroclaw, because I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's the first time, in, not for me the first time in Poland, but the first time in Wroclaw. And uh, I, I brought a very good friend of mine, uh, Reinhard, uh, Reinhard Stiebler, whose family c uh, comes from uh, Wroclaw, so Breslau, uh, uh, at the time. So he's my guy. He's been showing me around, so I'm very happy here. Now, we've been wondering <clears throat> yesterday uh, who were the uh, uh, economists, uh, whether, whether there was any school of economics here in, 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 in Wroclaw before the current one, right? because we have very uh, important current uh, uh, a whole gang of, of young and dynamic uh, economists who are doing great work here in Wroclaw. So is there any prehistory there, right? Uh, and I'll say a few, I've found some, so uh, a few, a few remarks on this. And then we'll move in to talk about uh, theories of market failures, which will serve us as, as an introduction, before we get to the theory of positive externalities. And then zoom in on one particular feature, which is in line with my current uh, stuff, namely the postulate of complete markets. Okay, and then I shall conclude. Okay, famous economists uh, from uh, Wroclaw. Now, I've listed here only those who have been professors at the university uh, in, in uh, Wroclaw. And I mean, it's not a full list, of course, but those that I knew, right? For example, one uh, famous person who's not uh, included in this is the um, um, uh, Nobel Prize winner, Reinhard Selten. He's, a, he's a, a German economist who got the Nobel Prize in 1994. He's a mathematical economist who really hasn't got much to do with Austrian economics. And okay, um, and he died a few years uh, back. He was born in Wroclaw, but um, uh, was never a professor here. So among the people who are professor here, who are quite well known among German economists, but nobody talks about them anymore any longer, uh, are Luio Brentano. Uh, his family is from uh, Franconia, so northern, uh, northern Bavaria. And he was here a professor between uh, 1872 and 1882. He was a member of the historical school. Okay, so it didn't start out well for, for Wroclaw, okay? Then it got worse, right? Because <laughs> uh, many of you might know the name of this person. He's actually a very brilliant writer. I wouldn't say a brilliant economist because he's not much of an economist, but he's really an economic historian. And he wrote uh, really very good, uh, very interesting words. I um, uh, recommend in particular his uh, 1903 book, uh, uh, The Bourgeois. It's a very good book. 
and as well his, uh, his theory of uh, the history of, of, of the German economy, uh, the uh, Zombat is very, um, in many ways, he is a predecessor of um, uh, Thomas Piketty, right? So the French uh, economist was very uh, fairly well known uh, today. Uh, like Piketty, is somebody who actually didn't know much about economics, <laughs> but just uh, unfortunately happened to be become a famous professor of economics. And uh, Zombat uh, didn't know anything about econometrics, whereas P Piketty does. And, uh, but Zombat was a quite good historian, so he used history as much as possible to promote a very statist and uh, socialist uh, agenda. And uh, the reason why he screwed up completely, also in, in politically, practically, is because he didn't understand anything about money. He wrote a lot about money, but he didn't understand anything. He should have studied a little bit more Ludwig von Mises' book, right, the 1912 book, uh, Theory of Money and Credit, that might given him a uh, uh, more proper framework, but he didn't. Okay, so two guys who are not really very uh, wonderful from an Austrian perspective, but we come to a third guy. Nobody of you, I'm sure, knows him, but I've known him, because Adolf Weber uh, is the uh, professor of my professor. Okay, he was the uh, professor in, at the University of Munich of the guy under whom I was studying at the University of Berlin and Reinhardt as well, uh, Hans Hermann Lechner. So of Adolf Weber, Ludwig von Mises said, of all the German economists, uh, Adolf Weber is, is closest to my own thinking. So this guy is actually a good guy from the Austrian perspective. And he taught here at uh, the University of Wroclaw from 1913 to 1918. And in 1917, he created uh, the Institute for Eastern European uh, Economies. Uh, then we had uh, uh, Günther Schmölders. Nobody of you knows him, uh, know him as well. He was um, uh, from uh, Western Germany, but got an habilitation in uh, Wroclaw and actually was a professor here, uh, we just found out, from 1934 to 1940 and then moved to the University of Cologne, and he spent there the rest of his life. He was the president of the Mont Pelerin Society from 1968 to 1970. So he's also somebody who is uh, ideologically, politically quite close to the Austrians. He's also affiliated with the University of Wroclaw. And now then, of course, we come to the, the, the current, uh, well, more recent generation, right? We have Witold uh, Krasnitsky. Uh, so un unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but uh, his memory is living in the, uh, in the minds and the hearts of, of many of you who are here, and I'm sure uh, this heritage will bear fruit in the, in the future, especially, right, so there's a young group of economists I'm just listening to here because I don't want to uh, uh, spoil, right, your, uh, your ego. So I'm just doing this in the case of Matteo, she's already a professor in Arcadius, right, so listen, these two guys here, not, not all the others, okay? But I'm very proud of you, and I'm sure you will do a great job in the future, and you're part of a long tradition, okay? Now let's talk about the uh, theories of market uh, failure, uh, which brings us to interventionism, because interventionism being an intervention in the ordinary manner of running things, like respecting private property rights and so on, needs always justifications, needs explanations. Why don't we handle things as we ordinarily do, just by letting people run? And here we can distinguish macroeconomic theories from microeconomic theories. And uh, I will say a few words about macroeconomic theories and then today uh, focus on microeconomic theories. So in macroeconomics, we have most notably the theory of idle resources, which uh, has been called this by um, William Hutt, which is a South African uh, economist, and is actually at the heart of Keynesian macroeconomics. Because what the Keynesians, in fact, argue all the time is that by expansionary uh, macroeconomic policies, this was policies which di directly or indirectly promote aggregate spending, you mobilize resources that otherwise would have been held back by the current owners. So for Keynes, the worst thing that you can do with the resource is to just keep it idle, keep it in reserve. That's very bad. It's actually not a typically Keynesian idea. It's, it's, it's quite old. Right? You find it also from, from the 16th century onward. And in the 19th century, it was an uh, idea promoted by the St. Simonians. Right? If you, if I, I don't go into this. The students, you should look it up, right? St. Simon, 
so French uh, um, philosopher, economist, uh, who had exactly this idea that uh, the government should intervene in order to promote the utilization, if possible, of all available resources in society. So any, holding anything in reserve uh, would be bad, right? And so by just spending more money, you increase the revenues associated with using the resources and thereby entice the, the, the current owners to actually lend them to other people or uh, sell them or whatever. Uh, second uh, theory uh, that is very important in our own day is the, are the perils of price deflation. Right? So here we know again, right, the, the, for the Keynesians, price deflation is very, very bad, especially because it encourages uh, money hoarding. Right? If uh, the, the general price level tends to fall, then people have an incentive of just keeping their cash on hand rather than exchange it on the market that is spent it for consumer goods or invest it. It right, would be very, very bad. And I myself, um, uh, along with uh, various other recent Austrian economists, uh, uh, wrote quite a bit on, in defense of, of price inflation. Um, because price, and I think I consider this personally to be one of the most important topics in, in macroeconomics economics, and uh, encourage all young Austrians to familiarize themselves with the literature. Right? So reading in particular, uh, for example, Philipp Bargos also, uh, uh, Josef Schima, what they have written on this, uh, on this topic. Uh, a third uh, theory that we might mention here are the, the benefits of, of cheap credit. And here, of course, this brings us to the, uh, which is actually the main topic of Ludwig von Mises' uh, theory of the business cycle. Right? So Mises is, is famous for having uh, presented in uh, his book on the theory of money, so the 1912 book, which I had already alluded to, uh, a theory of economic crisis. And at the heart of his explanation is the distinction between um, the, the number of projects that entrepreneurs can start and the number of projects that they can finish. Okay. So what Mises actually makes at the heart of his reasoning is a very elementary point, namely that we can start lots of things, but we cannot finish everything that we start. We need to, in order to finish, we need to stay with our, uh, within our means. And that's what you do, of course, as students, right? If you get uh, diverted, right? you dissipate, you do two things at the same time. You do not just study economics, but also psychology and uh, sociology, and I don't know what. You have three girlfriends or three boyfriends, right? And you play hockey and, 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 and darts and whatever, and you hang out in the bars. Well, it gets a bit, it gets a bit hard, right? To bring all of these things to fruition, right? I mean, it's difficult to maintain a human relationship with your various lovers, and it becomes very difficult to actually learn something about economics and um, psychology and so on. Right? So the success is to focus and to bundle the available resources in order to bring one thing of relatively few things to completion. And what we can bring to completion always depend on our real endowments, right? on the stuff that we own and on the time that we have. Right? So we need to stay within these means. Now. Uh, as Mises has explained in his book, that um, uh, when central banks intervene in the, in the money supply, so they prop up the money supply, the consequence is that credit becomes available, it becomes artificially cheap. And as a consequence, more entrepreneurs can start their projects than it would otherwise have been possible. So more projects become, can be started, but it is not possible to bring to completion more projects on the aggregate level. Right? So there's some redistribution process going on because the central bank uh, increases the money supply. There are some beneficiaries, uh, so they might actually now be in a position to, well, actually complete their projects. So that's true. But on the aggregate level, if we look at the economy as a whole, that is not possible. Uh, so we have here uh, in, in Mises' work probably the... Uh, one of the most uh, brilliant chapters of macroeconomics, because the basic idea in macroeconomics is that what is rational from an individual point of view, and what works from an individual point of view, is not always working from an overall point of view. Right? So in macroeconomics, we need to uh, consider, we need to take account of unintended consequences of human action. And mo much of macroeconomic analysis revolves around the analysis of unintended of these unintended consequences. Okay, 
So this being said, right, so we have all these, these things are market failures, right? Uh, the market doesn't use all available resources. That's a failure. Government need, needs to intervene to make sure that all resources are effectively used. Uh, the market if one economy would tend to produce price deflation. That's very bad because people would start money hoarding and not spend enough. So government needs to intervene. And another market failure is uh, indeed that there's not enough cheap credit uh, available. People are artificially limited in the amount of projects that they can pursue. So the government needs to intervene. And each time, the Austrians and others as well, it is true, have uh, responded to uh, this quackery, because that's what it is, and set the record straight. So let's turn to microeconomics. So we have here again various uh, theories, it's in particular with the theory of information uh, asymmetry, uh, right? So some people know more about uh, 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 economically relevant facts than others, and this might lead to exploitative uh, contractual uh, situations. A standard example would be um, uh, an employment contract in which an uh, entrepreneur hires a person to run whatever, uh, a store for him, some, some warehouse, and then the entrepreneur is not constantly there, he just uh, trusts uh, uh, the person, so the, uh, the, the entrepreneur is imperfectly well informed, that is, he might not be informed at all, whereas the other person knows exactly what he's doing. And so the contract might stipulate that he, whatever, spend eight hours a day and doing this and this and this uh, activity on the, on the spot, but he doesn't, right? And there's no way for the entrepreneur to verify this because he's imperfectly informed. So we have a so-called moral hazard problem, right? The, the, the employee knows that the entrepreneur doesn't know, and as a consequence, he's uh, likely to uh, exploit uh, his uh, situation, we have an information asymmetry, a, a market failure, uh, so-called. Um, then we have uh, um, the a problem of negative externalities. Uh, most exam important example would be pollution. Right? So we set up a factory and uh, uh, producing stuff with combustion engines, and the combustion engines, well, they emit smoke and various other things, and this is uh, uh, negative uh, uh, effect on, on other people, on neighbors that are living around it, and so on. Uh, the case of positive externality, so this is what we will be interested in, in what follows, most particularly, uh, in which uh, case uh, acting uh, uh, persons do certain things, so they, they cater, for example, to a, a customer, so you're setting up shop, shop uh, in a town, and you're always cleaning in front of your, uh, your shop in order to attract customers. But this is also beneficial to the uh, merchants left and right from you because now the, the street is cleaner than it otherwise have been because you are watching what's going on in, in front of your stop, uh, shop. Uh, there prevails greater security than if nobody were watching and so on. So you create beneficial side effects for other people. Uh, or for example, standard example would be, more standard example would be you have a, uh, a bee, um, a honey producer, right? And the honey producer, so he keeps his bees, and uh, but the bees also provide services for other people. For example, for people who have an um, uh, apple tree orchard, right? And the apple trees need to be fructified, which can occur only through the insects, right? So the, the apple tree owner actually benefits from the presence of the honey producer, uh, but he doesn't pay him, right? So it's, it's, uh, as a consequence, the production costs of the uh, uh, apple producer are artificially low and the revenue of the uh, honey producer is artificially low as well. Right? So that's negative from the, the overall uh, point of view because um, there are, as a consequence, too, too many apples that are being produced. Right? Pro uh, production costs are artificially low and there's not enough honey production because the revenues are also artificially low. Right? So probably then the, the government should intervene and do something about it. Uh, one important example of um, uh, positive externalities are public goods. Right? So in the case of a public good, uh, we actually <coughs> need to, uh, the classic case would be a national defense, right? the country need to be defended. And the problem is that uh, defense services cannot be produced uh, competitively because everybody uh, in such a, uh, a case would be equally well pro uh, protected both those who pay the army and those who do not pay. And let's say the army pro protects all of Silesia or all of Poland 
And uh, so some people uh, become paying customers of the protection services, right? So they fund the army, uh, that, that's fine, but all, the, all of their neighbors uh, who do not contribute uh, anything at all, they're equally well protected. So as a consequence, the revenue of the army is too low, right? There are positive externalities resulting from its uh, activities, um, but there, there's no revenue associated with it. So in that case, right, so the government needs to intervene and produce uh, these services, it needs to produce public goods such as uh, defense and, and other things. And finally, we might mention uh, the theory of uh, 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 transaction costs, right? which make that while well, exchange uh, is actually not costless for all the entrepreneurs, if we make contracts, uh, uh, the contract is just it takes place in an instant of time, but it needs to be prepared, right? And it needs to be monitored. The execution needs to be monitored, right? So it's it's costly actually. It absorbs resources. And, and uh, so we have here a de a deviation from the ideal world of uh, perfectly of the perfectly competitive uh, economy. Now I won't say much about information uh, asymmetries and negative externalities. Uh, if you're interested, we can discuss these things later in the questions. And what follows, I will uh, focus on uh, positive uh, externalities. Right? So if the, here the theory of positive externalities, now I've just presented it. Uh, the example of the bee producer and the honey producer. Now, what's the uh, response that this uh, theory has re uh, received from the side of Austrians? Um, in fact, um, Mises was one of the first uh, economists to, to comment on, on, this, uh, on this theory uh, already in uh, his book, Human Action, published in 1949, at a point of time when the canonical version of the theory of positive ex external effects was not yet articulated. This canonical version that we use in textbooks today uh, dates from the 1950s and it comes from uh, Paul Samuels. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Mises um, uh, discusses positive and negative externalities in human action on the, on the page that you see here. The edition is available on the internet, so I won't read it line by line. But the main idea is the following. The argument in the case of positive externalities is the following. Uh, the argument consists in saying that uh, this so-called underproduction is a sectoral problem for the economy. It's not an aggregate problem. Okay? If there is too much uh, apple production and not enough honey production as compared to the situation in which no positive externalities existed, well, that's uh, actually good for the apple producers and for apple consumers, and it's bad for uh, honey producers and honey consumers. But it is not an aggregate problem. Right? The fact that more resources are absorbed into one line of business simply means that less resources are available in other lines of business. Right? So that's really, it's not a collective problem at all. It just means, well, that some things are given the current circumstances, in particular the presence of external effects, are uh, produced to a greater extent than there would be in, in the case in which no external effects existed. But, I mean, they do exist, and they are part of uh, the nature of, of things, part of the nature of honey production and of apple production, so it's not a big deal. Okay? So that's Mises' argument. Now, the typical response that Mises would get from uh, Paul Samuels and from uh, most uh, present-day economists is um, uh, would, to, uh, present, would be to present positive externalities as a deviation from general equilibrium. Right? So uh, uh, positive externalities would still be a market failure by this criterion. So I'll present the argument. Uh, and then we'll uh, uh, discuss the, the Austrian responses. So positive externalities are still a market failure, right? So we have not only a sectoral misallocation, we have actually a sectoral misallocation, which is an aggregate problem because it represents a deviation from what would have happened if no positive externalities had existed. And in that case, uh, the, the situation that would have prevailed is one of a general equilibrium in the sense of uh, Kenneth Arrow and uh, Gérald de Breu. Right. So in such a, an equilibrium, all market participants have perfect anticipations. Uh, there are no transaction costs, 
there's a perfect divisibility of all goods, and especially, and this is a point on which I will focus in what, what follows, we have complete markets. That is, every single good that is produced is also paid for. Right? All goods are markets. In perfect, so in general equilibrium uh, theory, in this you find not only in Arrow and De Bruyne, but you also find it right from Valras, right, right from the start of this of this theory, uh, the hypothesis of complete markets. That's how it's called. Plays a central role, right? and it says that in a in a perfect market, all goods that are not transferred in the form of a gift, that is, which are not intended as a gift are actually compensated by the beneficiaries. What are the Austrian uh, responses to this argument? Well, one very famous argument uh, was not uh, proposed by uh, an Austrian in the narrow sense, but by a libertarian fellow traveler, namely Harold Demsitz. And Harold Demsitz says here, well, this standard of comparison, namely the a perfect equilibrium market, is a, uh, is a, a nirvana fallacy. Right? The fallacy consists in comparing the real world as it exists to a world that we imagine that we would like to exist, maybe, but which can never exist effectively because human beings and the nature of, of, of the world are not made that way. It could never possibly exist. So it is not a relevant benchmark to assess the efficiency of human action. To give an example, you can say, okay, it's, it's a market failure if I'm not able to fly through this room and get to this camera, something like this, right? It's, it's, it's a fallacy, it's, 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 it's a market failure because I'm not able to do this, but it's silly to say this because no human being could possibly do it. Right? I'm not able to anticipate fully what will happen in the year 2100, and as a consequence, I manage very imperfectly the financial affairs of my family today. It's also an irrelevant consideration because no, no human being is able to do this. So the, the proper way to assess uh, the preferability of any choice as compared to other things is always to consider alternative real choices that people could possibly make. Otherwise, we fall prey to the nirvana fallacy. The uh, second uh, uh, objection that would typically be made by Austrians would be to highlight the problem of measuring positive externalities. So let's say, despite the nirvana fallacy problem, we say, okay, but we still wish to redress this problem, right? We still want to make sure that the, the Apple producer has higher cost and that the B producer has higher revenue, right? So then the question is, well, how much higher should be the cost of the Apple producer and how much higher should be the revenue of the bee, of the honey producer, right? And there is, in fact, no way to know this because there is no way no analytical way to get to know uh, what a general equilibrium world of a perfect market would look like. Right? So maybe, I mean, if you're a, uh, if you're a mystic, right? you have an immediate vision of how things should be in the ideal world, yes, maybe you have a, a, a preferred way of, of getting to knowledge in, uh, in this way, but for, a human, uh, for the human intellect, there's no way actually to, uh, to get there. And as Mises has pointed out in his discussion uh, on the possibility of, of socialism, right, because at bottom we have here the same problem, we have the socialist calculation problem. Right? Uh, we, we cannot uh, actually know how we would get there, let's say even if we, by miracle, we knew how a uh, general equilibrium ideal situation should look like, we would not know what to do in order to get there. And right? so we could not create uh, such a world. Okay, and then there is um, uh, another fundamental problem. This is the one that I would like to uh, discuss in, in what follows. I would focus on, on this uh, in a bit more detail by highlighting uh, the, the central question why markets should ever be complete. Why should they be complete? It's true that complete markets are uh, an element of general equilibrium of the Valras and Arrow de Breu sort. Right? So all goods have markets. Each good that is provided to other people is actually paid. But why should this be so? The real world obviously is not that way. 
in the real world, we do have external, positive external effects. So what's wrong with the state of affairs? So we have here then a few words on the origins of this uh, postulate of complete markets. <clears throat> uh, then some remarks on the consequences that follow from it. And then finally, uh, a critique. The first thing that can be said in favor of this postulate is that it greatly facilitates uh, quantitative modeling of the economy. Because if you want to use quantitative uh, models, well, you necessarily have an equation sign somewhere. Okay. So it, it, it's good if all uh, quantities are associated with certain prices. Right? Otherwise, the model is incomplete. Right? Or you cannot reason in terms of prices, then you just have a model that uh, of, of the Varesian sort, uh, in which uh, you uh, simultaneously de determine uh, the quantities and subjective values or utilities or affinities of all goods involved. That's, um, um, uh, but, 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 but then, uh, then again, right, so you wouldn't have the, the markets. Um, now, this um, <clears throat> Uh, facilitation is, of course, is convenient for the theoretician, but this alone would not uh, convince us to accept the postulate. I mean, okay, this facilitates mathematical, the mathematical analysis of the, the economy from an overall point of view, but uh, it seems to be exaggerated to infer therefrom that we should bring the real world closer to this uh, mathematical model. I mean, it's simpler to, to, to create equ equations to describe the world, fine, but why should we make the world resemble more, more closely such an imaginary world simply just because it was convenient for our modeling? It's like putting the, the, the cart in front of the horse. But there's a second uh, origin that probably has played an even uh, greater and more substantial role, namely uh, the Aristotelian doctrine of just exchange. Aristotle, in uh, the Nicomachean uh, Ethics, in chapter 5, where he deals with, uh, just, uh, with the virtue of justice, right, argues, well, that uh, uh, justice is a, s a sound middle ground between opposing vices, and the virtue of justice itself is um, characterized by the equality of different terms, and most notably the uh, justice in exchange is always characterized by the equality of the goods that are being exchanged. So if I provide something to other market participants in a market exchange, then what I receive as a payment should have exactly the same value as that what I give. That's Aristotle's theory. Okay. Now, if, if we accept this, this theory for the moment, well, then it, it seems to follow that, yes, indeed, we want to make sure that all services that are provided to other people, even if it's outside of an exchange, should be compensated, and the just compensation would be a remuneration, a reward, in terms of something that is exactly the same value as that which has been given. And in light of this theory, we can also understand an appeal that general equilibrium models might have, because in general equilibrium models, in final equilibrium, all rewards earned are exactly equal to the cost of production. So a firm in a com uh, perfectly competitive market, and, and Professor Mackay, I know he has written a nice little book on, on, on the topic, right? in a perfectly com uh, competitive market, right? a firm earns revenue, but this revenue is just exactly equal to um, the, its cost of production, so it earns no profit. And not only is uh, the um, uh, cost equal to, to the revenue, so, so, but also average cost of each factor of production is exactly equal to the average revenue per unit sold, and uh, this average, revenue is, uh, average cost is also equal to the marginal cost of each factor of production. So we have this perfectly just situation, very appealing. It almost seems as though the model has been created in order to satisfy the Aristotelian criterion of just exchange. Now, what are the consequences if we accept this, uh, this uh, theory? 
right? So we now understand why the postulate of complete markets might be interesting, not only from a purely technical point of view, but also from a substantial, from an ethical point of view. Now, clearly, in this slide, positive externalities are market failures, right? And in fact, not only positive externalities would be market failures, but in fact, all unintentional gratuitous goods are market failures. Now, what is an unintentional gratuitous good? I'll give you a few examples. Exactly an example, right, is an unintentional gratuitous good. If you're giving a good example to others, uh, these others don't have to pay for your example. And if you give a bad example to others, these others don't have to pay for your bad example. Yeah? Your bad example is a good example for these others. You say something stupid, they realize that it's stupid, well, they won't say it again. Uh, you invest in a line of business and you lose a lot of money, well, others are looking at this and, and, and saying, well, well, I shouldn't do that. Okay. So good examples and bad examples are gratuitous goods provided to others. Virtuous behavior creates material gratuitous goods to others. If I always say the truth, well, and people can rely on what I say, that actually saves them a lot, a lot of uh, cost, verification costs and so on. They save resources. If I'm just in my dealings with others and I respect the law and so on, also saves them a lot of money. It's a gratuitous good. It's not completely uninterested uh, f from their point of view, but in, in, in fact, it, and I, I might do things that are just out of self-interest. I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but then, of course, it would no longer be virtuous, right? If I respect the contract because otherwise I get into, into a prison, that wouldn't be a virtuous behavior. It would be uh, self-interested behavior, right? But so, virtuous behavior creates positive external effects just as uh, self-interested behavior of this sort. Now, uh, another example that is well known to all of you who learn uh, basic uh, value theory from, from an Austrian, well, you know that in an exchange, the exchange goods actually do not have the same subjective value. They do not have the same utility, but they have different subjective values. If you go to the baker shop and you pay five slotty for a bread, okay, let's say four, four slotty for a bread, right? then what happens is not that you give the exact same value to the uh, baker that you receive from him, but you receive from him something that you appreciate more than that what you give. You prefer to have the bad bread to keeping the, the four slotties. And he prefers the four slotties to having the bread. Right? For in his case, it's, it's very easy because, well, he has the whole shop full of bread and he cannot eat it all, all on his own. Right? So he wants to get rid of it. For him, the subjective value is close to zero. So in exchange, we always have this effect. We always create, whether we want it or not, we create a positive value effect for other people. And it's gratuitous. It's something that does not depend on whether we wish it to be the case or not. It follows from our action objectively. And then, of course, there are various price effects of exchange, which are, in microeconomic theory, they are known as, as income effects. Right? You have an income, for example, you have an increase in in a, a decrease in, in the price of, of a good, then as a consequence, that good will likely to be, uh, de be in greater demand because its price has fallen rather than other goods. So this is called a, a substitution effect. But because the price has diminished, it means that with uh, the same amount of money as before, you can buy more units of this good. And right? so you have an income effect. Now this income effect, again, does not depend on what uh, the market participants wish to be the case, and they might not actually desire this to, 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 uh, to happen. They, not, they might not wish that their trading partners have a higher real income. But in, nevertheless, it happens, it results from their activities. Right? So if I become more productive as an apple producer and I bring more apples to the market, well, the price will fall, and this will create income effects for my customers. I cannot prevent this. And then there are various externalities of savings. Now, this might carry us a little bit far, but I will give just one example. Uh, and here we, and we have full uh, accord between the Austrians on the one hand and uh, Chicago School monetarists on the other hand. And, uh, if we uh, think, for example, of uh, the case of money hoarding. And if I hoard my, uh, more money, I'm saving cash, 
Right? The consequence will be that I, I uh, so I withdraw this cash from, from circulation, so to say, and as a consequence, money will be scarcer in, in, uh, in exchange relative to non-monetary goods. As a consequence, money prices will diminish, right? Less money will be given in exchange for all other goods. Right? So what, what does this mean? It means that as a consequence of my saving cash, the purchasing power of the money units that are still being exchanged by all other people increase. Well, of course, if it's my case, I'm not particularly rich. If I'm saving more cash, there's no impact, no noticeable impact at all. But if a lot of people save more cash, or if somebody who's really very rich saves a lot more cash, well, it will have a noticeable effect on prices, and therefore everybody will have a noticeable income effect. And again, this is not necessarily intended. Right? You might be happy that it happens, but it would result from your action whether you desire it or not. And then uh, the last example, which is probably best known, is are the ex externalities of technical, technological progress. Right? And innovation, when it was first brought into, into being, so there's some people, some persons who bear the, the production costs, right? so they uh, pay for research and development, uh, let's say uh, Gutenberg, who vents the, the printing press, right? and then if everybody is free to imitate Gutenberg, well, then his invention will spread very rapidly throughout the rest of the economy. Other people who didn't have to spend much time and uh, intelligence developing uh, the, this machine, well, will be able to copy it, to imitate it, right? and as a consequence, the value of, of the machine will drop to purely material production costs. And the main beneficiaries of this situation are all people who read books and who buy books. Right? So they didn't contribute in any way to this, to this uh, result, but they are benefit, benefiting from these gratuitous effects of uh, invention. So what is then the critique, uh, the, the points of critique that we can um, bring up against the postulate of com complete markets? Well, first of all, and most fundamentally, against Aristotle, we should uh, point out that a just exchange is not an exchange of equal values. And that's what we've seen. That's what we know as Austrians, because actually we were teaching the subjective theory of value. Right? We know that in exchange, we do not exchange equal values, but values of different uh, goods of, that have different values. So it's not the case. Uh, and therefore, an exchange could not possibly be an exchange of equal values. Right? Now, um, there's still a, a way to, to salvage the, the main idea of, of, of Aristotle's theory of justice, right? namely that you need to have, uh, well, a, a just exchange. But I won't go into this now. I, I think uh, Aristotle just went wrong in focusing uh, or in, in pursuing um, uh, the development of a criterion in the, in the area of, of, of value. Right? So his benchmark was equal value. This, this doesn't work. But if you had followed, let's say, the Rothbardian approach and focused on private property, uh, then he might have come and said, okay, we have a benchmark in the, in the question, are uh, property rights respected? And if they're not respected, then necessarily one person gains at the expense of another person. And so you have an unjust distribution of, of economic goods. And so just exchange is possible to the extent that no property rights are being violated, but it has nothing to do with equal value of the goods that are being exchanged. And uh, contra uh, Varas and Arrow de Bro, uh, we need to hold that, well, uh, the postulate of complete markets is just that. It is a postulate. It's something that we make up because it facilitates our reasoning and maybe because it finds a vindication in Aristotelian ethics. But it's not something uh, that it really grows out of the, the nature of the economy as it is. The consequence of this postulate is that neoclassical uh, general equilibrium economics is actually less general than Austrian general equilibrium economics. Sometimes uh, there's an opposition between uh, neoclassical economics and Austrian economics by saying, well, the neoclassicals, they just focus on equilibrium and we focus on the market process. That's a way of putting it. It's, it's a pedagogical way of putting it, but it's a bit shallow. 
Right? Because in Austrian economics, we also have a conception of general equilibrium. And it's essentially, this very similar in its, in its hard chords, the, the same as in the neoclassicals, because the characteristic feature of a general equilibrium is that no more arbitrage is possible. Sometimes that's called the Pareto efficiency, right? If you can no longer perform any change in your activity in order to benefit, uh, uh, obtain a greater benefit, if you reached a state of perfection in that sense, no change in your uh, behavior would bring any improvement for you, and then we have reached a state of general equilibrium. That's the same in Austrian economics and in neoclassical economics. What the neoclassicals do is to introduce another postulate, the postulate of complete markets, which is absent from Austrian economics. Austrian economics is more general. They are creating a more specific uh, conception right, based on the uh, complete markets, essentially because it's more technically easy to apply uh, quantitative modeling techniques. So let me conclude then. I think four points, four or five points of conclusion. First thing, as we have seen today, economics is thriving in Wroclaw, uh, and especially Austrian economics. Uh, second, uh, the theories of market failure deserve close attention, especially from the side of, uh, of young economists. Right? So you should familiarize your, yourself with these uh, theories because they are actually what brings us close to practice, right? to political practice. Uh, third, science never stops. Right? So, even what Austrians have, I mean, of course, you should familiarize yourself with all the arguments. Uh, what neoclassicals have said about this topic and what the Austrians have responded, but that's not the last word. In science, we never have such thing as the last word. And what we do in science always is to question the premises and the reasoning uh, that those who've come before us have put forward. Uh, third, uh, the fourth, as, I, as we've seen, right, the, the um, Austrian conception of general equilibrium is larger, it's more general, and I would also there, uh, say more realistic than the neoclassical one, and the neoclassical one is vitiated by uh, the postulate of, uh, incomplete, of complete markets, right, which is necessary for quantitative modeling, but vitiates the practical conclusions, uh, namely uh, the theory uh, or the, the conclusion that the if there are positive externalities, we are confronted with a case of, of market failure, whereas it is not at all the case. It's not a part case of market failure. It's just that some benefits are being provided unintentionally, spontaneously to other people, so good for them, and for him who carries on producing his honey, he's doing this because he's happy with his results anyway. That's why he carries on. He doesn't worry about uh, other people also benefiting from this. Just the same thing as when I take my shower in the morning, it's not just myself who are happy about this and I'm benefiting from it, but all other people around me uh, benefit as well. And uh, now we are much closer, and that's not a positive externality, but it's an intentional result of my keeping the time that uh, we are close to our dinner, closer to our dinner. Thank you very much for your attention. We, we, we have a f few minutes for, for questions. Yeah. So, uh, I didn't really understand the, uh, pro the response for the problem of positive externalities from Austrian economics. So, uh, could you please, uh, I, I know you gave a whole lecture about it, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, could, could you please summarize on an example that you gave on the very beginning on national defense? Yeah, national defense, actually, I, um, uh, I mean, Mises, for, for Mises would be a problem, right? Because national defense is a public good, and Mises actually does believe uh, that we need a minimal state to produce such goods. So he would not respond to anything. I would respond, yes, we have by and large the same problem as everywhere else, right? If we uh, didn't have the government, then less national defense would be produced. People would protect themselves in other ways, right? And that's perfectly fine in a, in a free society. It's just the risk that they take and, and so on. If people f uh, thought that uh, they would have to take preparations in order to pre f prepare against an onslaught, the Russians are coming, the Germans are coming, and I don't know what, right? Well, then they, they will bundle forces together. 
uh, Philip Bagos, a few years back, he published a very nice article on uh, dikes. And he took the example of dike construction in, in the Netherlands. The Netherlands, as you know, uh, are ex 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 existentially dependent on dikes yeah, because they're, most of the country is, what, about five or two to eight meters below the sea level. Right? So, but the government has for centuries not been involved in, in producing dikes. It's just purely voluntary work of people living close to the sea and cooperating uh, in, in, in this, this endeavor. So if the, the value of the problem is high enough, people do get together in order to solve it, even if there's no market for it, right? So they didn't pay companies doing this, that would have been, not have been worthwhile, but they joined forces spontaneously together. It was an association. And that's how it works in a free society. And right? if the problem is big enough, people bundle forces together or they pay somebody for it. That's how we do it. Right? And uh, if we don't, well, what does it mean? It means that the problem is not big enough, that we have other things that are more important to do, and we do them, we consecrate our resources to them, okay? So that's the first line of, of response. Then comes the, uh, the general equilibrium people, and they say, ah, yeah, 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 fine, fine, fine. So we have some difference in sexual allocation, but that's not neutral from an overall point of view, because it's still a deviation from general equilibrium. Now, that's a silly argument, and I think it has been, you didn't need to wait for the present day in order to demolish it because the Demsitz uh, Nirvana fallacy is enough, right? And that alone is enough in my eyes. And then also the, uh, the other considerations that Mises brought up in the context of uh, socialist calculation argument that you actually have no way of knowing what the ideal general equilibrium situation should be. Right? And then we discuss today another problem of this argument, which is the, the postulate of complete uh, markets, which is completely arbitrary. It's really, it's a, it's, it's a value judgment. It is not borne out by the facts, but superimposed on the analysis of reality. Okay. So, uh, can we basically say that from Austrian perspective, uh, positive externalities is not really a problem? Exactly. And it is a major difference between Austrian economics and neoclassical economics. And uh, so that's actually one, one point that I stress in my new book, which deals with gratuitous goods, and especially with spontaneous gratuitous goods. If you look at the world from an Austrian point of view, and you have no X to grind against positive externalities. It's just part of the nature of what it means to be a, a human being and what a, a human economy is all about. But well, we just are happy that there are lots of things that we get for free. Right? This is just wonderful. And uh, if you close your mind up into the neoclassical cage, and suddenly all of this seems to be problematic and unjust and, and so on, it has to be paid, and you, you suddenly become this, uh, uh, you have a, an accounting mindset, and yeah, but somebody should compensate me for this. Or you have to be, ha, 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 I got something for free and I, I, I enrich myself at the expense of other people. It's completely ridiculous. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah. Okay. Um, when it comes to the externalities of savings, uh, a great example, I think, is uh, Scrooge McDuck. Um, I, you probably already know uh, the fictional character I'm talking about. And uh, it's over, often overlooked that he just keeps all of his money and he never spends it, so all the uh, goods that he provides to the public are provided for free. And uh, so once in a while, in the politicians uh, complain that people ho are holding money in their socks. And uh, I would like to know if there's any sensible argument for why uh, the government should do something to make them spend that money or do something something else with it other than uh, well we like we, we would like to um, we would like to spend that money so we can take a tax off of it and is there any such argument well thanks of all first of all for bringing up scrooge mcduck who is one of my heroes and uh, mine and, too <laughs> yeah and i always bring him up in my classes in in in, in france um no, I think the only argument really uh, that has, has any merit is the, the, the idea that you create price deflationary tendencies and 
this will uh, might might entail a spirit, uh, spiraling deflation. Right? That's the standard Keynesian argument, and it's wrong. Right? It's uh, first of all, it's wrong empirically because there was a time when we were living in um, an economy in which the general tendency of the price level was downward. And that was especially the, the second half of the 19th century. Now, I, don't know, uh, the, I don't have the Polish figures, but at the time, well, Poland as a separate country didn't exist, so it was part of, of Germany, uh, uh, Russia, and, um, and uh, Austria-Hungary. And in all three, I mean, I don't have the data for Russia, but in Austria-Hungary and in Germany, the prices were downward as they were in France, as they were in, in Great Britain, as they were in the US. Right? So the tendency of the price level was downward, but it didn't entail a, a spiraling implosion of the economy, which is inexplicable from a Keynesian point of view. Right? Because for, for the Keynesians, as they have it, is as soon as prices start somewhat, but foreseeably, to go downward, well, then everybody will just hoard cash Right? And then nobody will earn any revenue anymore, and so even less money will be spent on consumer goods, the prices will go down, and so on. So we're just imploding, we're just disappearing into a black hole. Right? By and large, that's their vision. But it's not what's been taking place. And the explanation is very straightforward. Right? Because uh, as a human being, we are operating under the constraint of the stomach. Right? In order to, to live the happy moment when next week or next month or next year the prices will be lower than today, well, we need to consume a minimum to stay just alive, right? So we need to eat, we need to uh, house, we need to clothe ourselves, protect ourselves against the weather and so on. Right? So there's always a minimum spending that goes on and that is reinforced by uh, positive time preference. Right? Most people actually prefer to have stuff sooner than, than later. Right? And so even if they know that uh, a holiday in, in uh, Hungary will be less expensive uh, next year than this year, well, I mean, there are few that are actually postponing always the, the, the family vacation for that reason. Right? So really, price deflation is nothing to, to fear, but that's the only argument that is really out. It's some semblance of, a, of an argument, but I agree with you. But of course, uh, in practice, right, the reason why um, uh, we, we still hammer this uh, price deflation or monetary authorities hammer the price deflation argument is because most people don't have time to study economics or to think about this, and they just have fear. And they're always driving fear. That's what they live on. It's their business model. Right. Thank you. There was a question here, Jakob. Okay, so you, you mentioned that one way to dispose of the supposed problem of externalities, uh, positive externalities, is simply to treat them as generating uh, gratuitous goods or of them being gratuitous goods. But I was wondering whether, uh, I agree that's a good argument, but I was wondering whether you uh, couldn't uh, as well reply equally well that uh, it's part of the market process. You generate positive externalities and then by the same token, you support the existence of a system that is competitive, a system where technological diffusion takes place quickly. So you can reasonably anticipate, you can reasonably speculate as an entrepreneur that if you do not mind generating positive externalities, then you will benefit by someone else generating positive externalities. So in this sense, it informs uh, your general entrepreneurial vision. And in this sense, you do not even have to consider yourself as a special philanthropist of any sort, but, but simply as a shrewd entrepreneur who will benefit in turn. I mean, if you are Gutenberg and if a lot of books are being printed, then some uh, able uh, potential employee of yours will read a lot of books, maybe come up with some technological innovations in the printing industry and you will benefit from them in turn. So in this sense, it seems to me that, yes, you could conceptualize positive externalities as gratuitous goods, but by the same token, I suppose you could say that they are normal commercial goods, uh, profits that come back to you mm -hmm. if you operate within this vision of a broad, uh, competitive, uh, technologically effusive entrepreneurial society called mm -hmm. No, no, no I, I, I see your point, right? But it, it remains the case that it's still gratuitous because there's no contractual relationship between the beneficiary and the originators of those goods. Right? In that sense, they remain gratuitous. Of course, you can anticipate that this is being the case. Right? You're moving into a neighborhood where people are civilized and so on, and so they're respecting the law, they're cleaning the street. Yes, right? you, you know that you will benefit from it, but uh, it's gratuitous nevertheless.
Professor Hulsman, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Uh, Professor Mingardi, thank you uh, to the both of you uh, for uh, being a highlight of this conference. And now, please allow me to switch back into Polish to wrap the things up. Drodzy Państwo, zanim zakończymy, jest jedna ważna rzecz, o której muszę oczywiście powiedzieć. Wiedzą Państwo dobrze, w przeciwieństwie do naszego rządu, że nie ma czegoś takiego jak darmowe obiady. Nie ma też czegoś takiego jak darmowe konferencje. My w Instytucie Misesa działamy w oparciu tylko i wyłącznie o środki prywatne, dobrowolnie przekazane przez naszych darczyńców. Wszystkim im serdecznie z tego miejsca dziękuję. Jest jeden szczególny darczyńca, który w tym roku wspiera całą naszą ścieżkę edukacyjną, także tą konferencję Fundacja Wolności Gospodarczej, której CEO Marka Tatałę chciałbym teraz serdecznie zaprosić na scenę, ponieważ Marek ma na koniec wiadomość, która myślę dla Państwa będzie bardzo dobra. Marku, oddaję Ci głos. Dziękuję bardzo, dziękuję za zaproszenie. Świetne, świetne wydarzenie i myślę, że dobra inwestycja ze strony Fundacji Wolności Gospodarczej, tak jak inne wydarzenia edukacyjne, w których miałem przyjemność uczestniczyć. Przy okazji zwrócę uwagę, że jesteśmy w sali Unii Europejskiej. Zrobiłem tutaj zdjęcie przed, przed wyjściem. To nazwa tej sali wykładowej i przypomina mi się dyskusja, debata, którą mieliśmy na szóstym zjeździe austriackim z Przemysławem Hankusem i Mateuszem. Być może na kolejnej edycji e, można powtórzyć. Skład jest gotowy. Zobaczymy, czy się poglądy zmieniły przez te ostatnie kilka lat. E, a myślę, że temat może być ciekawy. Można o euro rozszerzyć i inne wątki e, europejskie. E, zanim jeszcze opowiem o tym, o czym powiedziałeś, to chciałem powiedzieć też o tym, że bardzo się cieszę, że została tutaj e, tak mocno zaakcentowana, zaakcentowana rola i dorobek profesora e, Kwaśnickiego. E, profesor Kwaśnicki był jedną z osób, która miała przyjemność jako pierwsza poznać ideę powstania fundacji i od samego początku e, wspierał nas różnymi radami, czasami recenzjami, czasami to były recenzje krytyczne, mam parę takich wiadomości na Messengerze, e, a czemu akurat tych wspierać, a co jest liberalnego w tym, więc bardzo dobrze, że kontrolował e, to, co e, robimy, ale e, był też blisko związany z miejscem, w którym zarejestrowana jest fundacja, bo wiele lat e, w młodości spędził w, w Blachowni koło Konopis, gdzie znajduje się siedziba firmy Presglas, która stworzyła Fundację Wolności Gospodarczej. E, I e, w związku z tym e, chciałbym e, zwrócić Państwu uwagę, szczególnie tym osobom, które tak jak Instytut Misesa są zaangażowane w organizacje pozarządowe, że już niebawem uruchamiamy kolejny konkurs grantowy. To w ten sposób Instytut Misesa otrzymał środki na to wydarzenie i na inne edukacyjne projekty, które realizowali, więc zachęcam do obserwacji naszych kanałów strony wolnagospodarka.pl i aplikowania. Zróbcie nam, utrudnijcie nam robotę. My chcemy wybierać nie tak jak w zeszłym roku z 90 aplikacji. Mam nadzieję, że będzie ich trudniej. Będzie się też oczywiście konkurencją dla Instytutu Misesa, ale myślę, że Instytut Misesa konkurencji się nie boi, a wręcz ją wspiera, więc liczę na to, że przynajmniej część z Państwa, o ile reprezentujecie organizację, będzie tym konkursem zainteresowana. Dziękuję jeszcze raz za zaproszenie, gratulacje kolejnego zjazdu i do zobaczenia na dziesiątym zjeździe za rok. Bardzo Ci dziękuję, Marku. No i przechodzimy do finiszu. Jeszcze kilka ogłoszeń porządkowych. Wciąż mogą Państwo nabyć książki, które znajdują się przy wyjściu. To jest ostatnia szansa dzisiaj, żeby to zrobić w tej cenie niższej niż na naszej stronie internetowej. Ci z Państwa, którzy wykupili wejściówki VIP, zapraszam serdecznie do restauracji Polka, która znajduje się na rynku. Z pozostałymi z Państwa widzimy się o godzinie 20.00 w tym miejscu, gdzie wczoraj w pubie Pinta, tam też dzisiaj odbędzie się obiecany na wczoraj quiz. Także szykujcie drużyny, mam nadzieję, że będzie zacięta rywalizacja. I jest ostatnia grupa osób, którym należy się podziękowanie. To są osoby, bez których to wydarzenie nie mogłoby się odbyć. Chciałem serdecznie podziękować wszystkim członkom zespołu Instytutu, którzy byli zaangażowani w przygotowanie tego wydarzenia, dyrektorowi Generalnemu Instytutu Mateuszowi Benedykowi, szefowi portalu Mises.pl Pawłowi Kotowi, naszemu działowi prasowemu i komunikacji Marcinowi Serafinowi, Hubertowi Wejmanowi oraz wszystkim wolontariuszom, 
których będę prosił, żeby wstali, pokazali się pan Igor Cedro, Wiktor Dolata, Kacper Elsner, Maksymilian Gałuszka, Filip i Jakub Juszczakowie oraz pani Joanna Kołaczek. Wstańcie proszę, nagrodźmy wielkimi brawami naszych wolontariuszy. Przywitałem Państwa piosenką. Myślę, że społeczeństwo, ekonomia i prawda były tutaj omówione. To, czy będą obronione, zależy już tylko od Państwa. Widzimy się, mam nadzieję, że wcześniej niż za rok, a na Zjeździe Austriackim za rok w Warszawie, w październiku świętujemy dwudziestolecie Instytutu Misesa. Do zobaczenia. Dziękuję.